Hello out there in YouTube land, welcome to the OK Good Review channel. So guys, we're picking up the part four where we left off in part three. Now, these are concurrent videos, so if you have not checked out the first parts of this series, which is Big Daddy Destruct, yours truly, kind of narrating us through this, guys. If you've not checked that out already, I encourage you to check out parts one, two, and three, guys. That'll bring you back up to speed. Part three took us through 1980, guys. So again, it is the... First two Alive records, the self-titled record, Hotter Than Hell, Dress to Kill, Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over, Love Gun, Dynasty, Unmasked, and of course, the four solo records, guys. Now where we're at is going to be us jumping into the 80s. So, like I was saying in the end of part three, guys, something happened, just like it did in the 70s, to change the course of Kiss's history. They had just lost, after the MS record, they had just lost completely Peter Chris. He was completely out of the band by that point, guys. So the four members of this larger-than-life Kiss troupe were shattered a little bit. And how would the fans react? What was going to happen from that point, guys? Well, Kiss with their sort of floundering two last records, which was Unmasked and Dynasty, felt like there needed to be a change made. And the person who really started putting them over the top was producer Bob Ezrin. So guys, here it is. Bob Ezrin, they got him back for Music from the Elder. This is possibly the most controversial record in the entire catalog of KISS. And let's take a look at it. So we have this, we have this. So, front cover. Inside cover. So what are we noticing here? We've got some references to an elder, which is a movie that never existed, guys. Trying to go for some legendary, maybe some night stuff, possibly, something like that. What don't you see? What do you see on every other KISS record? What don't you see on this KISS record? The band. The band. They had no face shots at all of the band on this record. And I think that threw a lot of people for a loop. The running order of this got really, really strange. In a lot of respects, it's an album without any hit singles. I will tell you this, guys. There are songs on here that are borderline great. The borderline the best they've ever done. And this album kicked off a really strong run for them of Preachers and then Lick It Up. Maybe Animalize you might consider in that. Maybe Asylum. Probably not Crazy Nights or Out in the Shade, but definitely Revenge. So it definitely hardened their song. They were uh, certainly a lot harder rock than they were before. I wouldn't say they were metal. This is a gutsy choice. And this also, guys, proved to be the last record from Ace Fraley. There has been no other album like this one before or since in the history of music, guys. And that's the only record that they have that I would really, I'd really put, put like that, guys. This is a spiritual predecessor to nearly everything that came after this until they put the makeup back on, guys. And I think it went out of print for a while. I remember when I first heard this, guys, I really, really, really wish they would have actually just made the movie. This would have been a movie I would have loved. I would have loved to have seen this movie. And there were, I think there was some talk on and off that they were going to try to go back and do it at some point. I don't think that's going to happen any longer. You go through this, guys, the first half, like you have fanfare after a song. That doesn't make any sense. But The Oath, Just a Boy, Dark Light, only You. All great songs, guys. They're all fantastic. Under the Rose, another really great one. The World Without Heroes. 
Uh, is I think Gene just laying it out. I thought this was super gutsy again. Mr. Blackwell's a throwaway. Escape from the Island is an instrumental. And honestly, it's an okay track, and that's about it. The last two songs, Odyssey and I, I think are just okay. So it is uneven. I mean, you got to you, you have to grant that it is definitely an uneven, an uneven record, guys. But there's when it's great, it is mind blowingly great. Listening to Kiss and getting into him and doing all that other stuff, this was one I came into a little bit lo farther down the road, and it blew me away. I I never heard anything like this, and especially from Kiss, you know, they sing about you know girls and partying and all that stuff all the time. This was actually intended to be a meaningful album and it's like it's tremendous i think it definitely certainly came a long way there it isn't as cohesive as it should have been but this is something guys that i would absolutely not want to be without this is just one of my favorite records from the band however it tanked this was also the last album with ace by the way so ace fraley does not play on another kiss record again after this until the reunion, which came, which will be in our uh, next video, guys. So, part five, the conclusion. So, we have Kiss Killers. This was something they threw together, and this is actually what they looked like. Uh, you had the Fox, which was your car there, replacing Peter Chris, And you had this weird sweatband thing for Paul Stanley. This was what the band looked like for the Elder. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, it was. And they threw four new songs on here. I think there's some lyrics or something in here. This, I think, was the last album that Casablanca did. And it, it really was almost more of an import, I think. Uh, four new songs. I'm a Legend Tonight, Down on Your Knees, Nowhere to Run, Partners in Crime. And they're honestly all kind of throwaways. But this is a really eclectic CD. Like we got Sure Knows Something. We have Escape from the Island of all things on this. Uh, Cold Gin, Love Gun, God of Thunder. I, I don't understand. When somebody put this, put this compilation together, I'm not sure what they were thinking. It's a very odd thing, but it does have new songs on it. And they're, they're, they're okay. I mean, they're, they're all right songs. Uh, this was, by the way, guys, when I came out, the longest Kiss record that was a studio record at 43 minutes. And from there, this one was 47, but again, greatest hits. The greatest hits and the live ones were quite a bit longer. From there, guys, they went to Creatures of the Night with this really whipping cover photo. Except there was a problem. By then, Vinnie Vincent was on the album, not Ace Frehley. Ace Frehley does not appear on here other than as some references in the lyrics, like Saint and Sinner. So they had a they, they had a, a little bit of an issue with that. And uh you could see still the 80s, we didn't put a lot of cool stuff in there. I got this one just because honestly I, I never I never actually listened to this. If I listen to it, I always listen to it on this one. But this one, it was. I, I just love this. I love this. Uh, this artwork. This artwork is nifty. And of course, <laughs> they re-released it during during the. Uh, this would have been probably past the asylum years with Bruce Kulick. Bruce Kulick is on it. He's also not on this. So two album covers. Neither guitarist is actually on this. Instead, it is one. Vincent Cusano, or as we all know and love him, Vinnie Vincent, that actually plays on this. So, that aside, what about the songs? So, Creatures of the Night is a pretty strong song. This one actually has Killer and Satan Sinner reversed. So, Satan Sinner is actually up here, Killer is here. Some of the strongest songs of their career actually show up on this record. They also got this huge huge massive drum sound on this uh this is definitely arena rock it's it's still hard rock i think they were using makeup actually for this tour i believe they were still because i think that's where the onk warrior came from or or whatever they called um whatever they called vinnie vincent the kick drum sound in particular is just gigantic on this 
but there's no ace and you know by then there's no beater of course as well uh as far as the songs on here war machine of course is a classic uh when i had a band we used to play i love it loud that's a fun song to do uh, i still love you definitely is that that sort of lovish song i guess we do a lot more of very good version of it but there's some weak stuff on here too uh rock and roll hell being one of them keep me coming they're okay-ish danger is okay-ish guys uh creatures itself is okay-ish killer is okay-ish this is a very okay-ish album i think that's probably the best way of putting this it definitely is showing you though where they're going to be going after the elder the elder really th so this album doesn't happen without the elder they really really got into the the more heavily distorted and and just got into that that whole vibe that would and they'd approach it uh like a lot of bands would throughout the 80s when you know when hair metal was the thing uh, again we so we got a three nine minute record here this one was huge there's no as no overestimating how gigantic of a record this was and they very wisely chose to come out of their masks with the release of this record very very smart thing to do my mom made a funny comment that she didn't understand why they wore makeup when they were all such handsome guys i will leave that to you to uh make whatever judgments you feel appropriate okay so in here we again have this really 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 cool uh commentary for the remaster series and we have honestly guys there is very little filler on here except for what they chose as singles ha <laughs> So, look it up and all hell's breaking loose. Two worst songs on here by a lot. And they release them as singles and make videos for them. But they did well, so I mean I guess there's that. This this was a lot more musically challenging. So what's the question, right? Is it is Destroyer the best record they ever did? I would push this one out there a little bit myself because this one had all the fire of Vinnie Vincent, but it was still Kiss. And Vinnie Vincent was just just an animal on guitar by a lot. This was one of their best lineups musically when they had uh, Vinnie Vincent there. He was possibly a bad guy. So technically, don't, uh, don't send me a bunch of comments about how much Ace fit the band better and all that. Ace obviously had better feel, but technically, I don't think that they've ever had anybody better than Vinnie Vincent in that band. And I would, I actually kind of think that for a lot of bands that Vinnie Vincent was in, that guy was just a beast on guitar. No question. The videos had this weird apocalypse theme, which we'll go into more on Animal Eyes, and they should have honestly kind of let it go. But what's interesting is this, we had great production, and you had Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons very, very, very motivated, and those two were trying to have this game of vocal one-upsmanship, and the winner was us by a lot. I don't know that I would actually say, I mean, Gene, Gene really put it out there for this record. Gene, as a studio vocalist, was always serviceable to pretty good. On this one, Gene honestly approaches great, and I think he kind of came close to that too on his solo record at times. But on this one, I mean, these guys were just getting out there and just shoving the, the pedal right through the floor. So, um, yeah, look it up. It's just a, one, of the, one of the greats of their career. Followed by this. So they fired Vinnie Vincent. And they got a guitar instructor, and they called him Mark St. John, and here you can read a little bit of history of the album at the time. And you're doing the apocalypse thing, right? So look it up, and all hell is breaking loose. We have the apocalypse theme, and they apparently decided to... Put it here where it makes no sense. So I don't, I don't, I don't understand what they're what they were going for here. Uh, this is not a very good record. It doesn't sound good. Of course, Heaven's on Fire is on here. That was a pretty big single for them. Outside of that, and the song that follows it, Thrills in the Night is good too. That's a really good stomp and riff. The rest of this though is just it. it when this first came out, it sounded muddy and weak and. That may, that's probably why that kid is not playing the other uh, tracks as much because they were 
just not anywhere near as good. This was my introduction to the band, and I hated the band, actually, for a long time because of this. So this was, honestly, in my view, one of the worst records that they've done. Jurassic Hill would also probably fall into that category as well. But this one was, there's no charm, right? Everything on here is borderline throwaway, except for the handful of fairly strong songs. But none of the charm, none of the goofiness, none of the fun was on this record. The album art is ridiculous. Look at this. What is this even supposed to mean? Tiger, zebra, leopard, something, cheetah, I don't know. The apex predator, big cats? I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get what they're trying to do. I, it, this makes no sense to me. I still don't understand this. And there's, I mean, just the songs are lower quality. This one checked in a little bit less, about 36 minutes, and I think they had to pad to even get it to that. So from there, Mark St. John was gone. So we had, in succession, Ace leaving the band, replaced by Vinnie Vincent. Vinnie Vincent got fired after this, but they brought him back for this. Fortunately, fortunately, they brought him back for this. Fired him again, brought in Mark St. John who had a arthritis issue and could not tour. So they brought in Bruce Kulik. Bruce Bruce for the tour of Animalize. And then they did the next record with Bruce Bruce. And you can see they've all got Bruce Bruce is the blue lipstick guy here. And Asylum with its sort of pastel nature to things here, guys. As goofy and as silly as this is, this was a better return to form. Now, you didn't have... I think they were trying to keep up with Vinnie Vincent on Look It Up. You didn't have anywhere near that kind of, you know, guitar firework power. I like Bruce Kulik. I think he's a good guitarist and a musician. But he is no... Like, he just doesn't have that, that kind of fire that Vincent brought. I mean, Vincent was, like, literally played like he was burning alive and it, it just kind of came through and i think it energized everybody this one was a pretty solid record though and kulik really sort of solidified the tumultuous lead guitar position with this record and then going on even though i think he was sorely tested a lot of times again so side one is pretty strong side two your tears are falling that was pretty strong and that's it. Tears are falling. So side one was pretty strong, and one song off side two was, was pretty good. Uh, again, the Gene songs are weak. A lot weaker on this one than the Paul songs. And this was maybe during the time when Gene was doing his acting thing. I don't, I don't actually remember what the operative years were. But Gene's songs are notably a downturn from Paul Stanley's. Uh, on Asylum... And on Animalize, this one actually, they there is a little bit more of a fun spirit though, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the tension, a lot of them trying to be hard or whatever they were trying to do on Animalize, is fortunately gone. Unfortunately, in some respects, what was replaced with is this. Now, if there is one worst record, the the the, the worst record in the catalog, this is certainly a strong contender. Uh, Crazy Nights, where they try to go pop for a large respect of it. This is definitely one of the worst records. I remember my brother and I listening to this and looking at each other and just like staring at each other like we couldn't believe it. Again, there's the power symbol. <laughs> but no, there's no power on here. One good song, guys, and it is no, no, no. That's it. One song. Thief of the Night, I guess. I, I You know, I'll give them that too. Thief of the Night is an okay song too. Oof, man. This is the Nevison record. The Gene songs are a lot harder than Paul songs are. So the Gene, Gene didn't didn't slack off a whole lot. Even when you know the reason to live is basically I want to know what love is, right? Nevison produced Foreigner as well. Um, really happy with that symbol. <laughs> oh my golly, Gashkins. I don't have a lot to say about this, guys. Getting this was certainly, <laughs> certainly, 
certainly because myself and my brother were diehard Kiss fans at the time. And I do like No, No, No. I think No, No, No is a good song. I think Thief of the Night is, is actually pretty decent, too. In fact, most of Gene's stuff on here is fairly solid. A lot of songs better than others, but it's just not a good record. This is this is a bad, actively bad record. Uh, one of the few in Kiss's career that was not good at all. They followed that up with an album called Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits. And that, I think, came out in 88. This, I believe, was 87, if I'm remembering this right. This is about 43 minutes. It feels like it's a lot longer, though. This, I think, was about 40 minutes. Analyze this was 36. Um, so you had the Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits, which featured two new songs, both Paul Stanley songs. You put the X and Sax and You Make Me Rock Hard. I believe they released one of those as a single. And that is not a uh, record that I would say is necessary in any way. The songs are not, the new songs to sell the record are just not, not that strong. I mean, it, they just aren't, they're just not that good. So let's recap. Music from the Elder. That I would put in the must pile. You guys can, that probably will, will elicit a little bit of disagreement, but I would say yes anyway. Oh, Creatures of the Night. I, I have to say yes. I have to say yes for that one also. So this is, there's the yes pile, which is steadily growing here. Um, and then from there we had Killers. Nope, definitely not. We had Lick It Up. Absolutely. We had Asylum. Not, not, I would say Asylum is not a necessary thing. Animalize, Crazy Nights, definitely not. So, guys, we can see we're pretty evenly matched so far with this series of the stuff that, that is necessary, the must-haves, and the things that you can safely skip. It'd be interesting, guys, to see where we wind up with this. I don't actually know. I just, I wasn't, this, so when I made the plans for this, that wasn't part of it. I just kind of threw that in there, and it's, it's just kind of interesting seeing the way it's, it's shaking out. Uh, and we, the next part is part five, the end of this series, guys. And we will go through all of the two piles, guys, and just kind of show you what's there. So that'll be coming up in part five. That's going to wrap it up for part four. This takes us all the way through 1988. Now, after this, it goes from 89 through 2012, which is a huge span. But the band was not releasing a whole ton of records. Instead, just kind of being a mobile jukebox, for lack of a better description, uh, doing things like Kiss Cruises and so on and so forth. So maybe Gene should have waited to do his acting career because he certainly had time for it, you know, kind of once, uh, once all that cleared. Anyway, guys, so there it is, part four, taking us through 1988 with the records, guys. And we'll be back for part five and the end of this coming up next.